dear colleagues, we are here today for an ESC webinar on the management of lower extremity artery disease. Welcome. I'm Professor Victor Aboyans from the Limoges University Hospital in France, and I have the pleasure of being joined by Professor Lucia Mazzolai from Lausanne University Hospital in Switzerland, and Professor Christine Espinola Klein from Mainz University Hospital in Germany. We are all the three members of the ESC Working Group on Aorta and Peripheral Vascular Diseases organizing this webinar for you. The aim of this webinar is to give you a better understanding of different aspects of the optimal management of patients with lower extremity artery disease through clinical cases. It is estimated nowadays that more than 230 million individuals are affected worldwide by this condition, with more than 30 million living in Europe. These patients are at high risk of cardiovascular disease, as high as patients with CAD, and definitely they deserve more attention for accurate diagnosis and optimal management, similar to many other cardiovascular conditions. This session is made for you and should be interactive. We strongly encourage you to actively participate by sending your questions and comments at any time during the webinar through the chat. For the best learning experience, we also invite you to participate in online assessment sessions in the form of MCQs that will be submitted during the presentation. This program is supported by Bayer Healthcare in the form of an educational grant. I will now hand over to Professor Lucia Mazzolai for the presentation. Lucia. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. Happy to be here to speak about lifestyle modification and exercise training in patients with lower extremity artery disease, which we'll call LEAD throughout the whole uh, webinar. These are my disclosures. And to set the stage, we're going to start with a clinical case. This is Jill, a woman of 69 years. She's known for lower extremity artery disease, but then within the last six months, she had a worsening of her left calf pain. Now she can walk a distance of about 350 meters, after which she starts to have pain, she needs to stop. She's also known for asymptomatic right carotid artery stenosis, and among her cardiovascular risk factors, she's an active smoker, she has hypercholesterolemia, no family history of cardiovascular disease, and no personal history of diabetes or hypertension. She's on statin and she's on antithrombotic, clopidogrel, and atorvastatin. When we examine her, she's normotensive, and when we look at her lower limbs, uh, we don't uh, palpate the left dorsal pedis artery, but she has no skin lesion, no temperature gradient. And when we go to the vascular examination, ABI is 075 on the left, which is worse than what she had before at uh, the prior uh, visit, which was 085. It's normal on the right side. On ultrasound, uh, we see several non-significant superficial femoral artery stenosis on the left side, and several atherosclerotic plaques in the common femoral artery bilaterally. The test on treadmill, it shows that she can walk 400 meters, and then we have to stop. This is her maximum walking distance. And when we measure again the ABI, once she's at rest, there is a decrease of more than 20% at one minute. So here we come to our first MCQ. Uh, which management would you propose to this patient at this stage? Either switch her to aspirin, 100 milligrams once daily, you perform a CT scan, you address her to a vascular surgeon for management, you enroll her in a supervised exercise program, or you just go for clinical observation and vascular follow-up in six months from now. So let's uh, give some time for uh, the audience to pick the, their, uh, their response. And one of the questions we ask at this time frame, it's always what kind of imaging we do. We already did ultrasound. Do we need in order to uh, really understand how we treat the patient, what's going to be the management, some other imaging, MRI, CT scan? This is a question that comes also. Or nothing, maybe. Very, or nothing. We have to see. So let's see the responses. So um, let's say that uh, the... Um, 
highest rate of response was about um, to enroll in a supervised exercise program, 47%. So it's a good start for you, Lucia. 12% proposed to switch to aspirin. 19 proposed to have a CT scan. 7% refer to vascular surgeon. And 17% uh, a clinical observation and vascular follow-up in six months. So what is your okay, take? Okay, so we are going to see with the rest of the presentation, but uh, I guess it's a good start to start with enrolling in supervised exercise program. And I'm going to show you also why that, that is important at this stage. So when we look at our lead patients and we start to look at their management, the two things we really want is to address general cardiovascular risk, but also we want to address lower extremity related symptoms. And what we really want to do is to improve the quality of life of patient because their functional impairment, their incapacity to walk, it's really what bothers them in their everyday life. So besides pharmacological uh, treatment, which we will hear uh, in a little while, what is also very important to address at this stage, it's lifestyle uh, uh, consulting and uh, to do some uh, uh, regular uh, exercise. And this is beneficial not only for, for the functional uh, symptoms, so improved quality of life, but also for general cardiovascular risk. So very important management strategies. And in fact, the guidelines, what do they tell us? What the guidelines that tell us that every PAD patient should have a healthy diet, physical activity, and this is really recommended, the class one recommendation. Smoking cessation is recommended also in those that smoke, is also a class one, and exercise for those patients with lead that are symptomatic. So we all know that lead patients are increased risk of cardiovascular events, impaired quality of life. We know that we have medical therapies and lifestyle counseling that do reduce these cardiovascular events and improve the functional status. But when we look at really everyday practice, we see this medical and lifestyle prevention strategies are really underused. So there is still a lot of uh, street that we can do, a lot of uh, am amelioration that we can do for our patients. And in fact, if we looked at a study from the United States, we see that among lead patients, the medication use for lowering, for example, cholesterol, statin use, it's only 33% of the lead patients. Only 28% of these patients are on inhibitors of the renin-angiotensin uh, system. Only on 22% of the visits, uh, patients are actually uh, advised to do exercise or to think about their diet. And among those that smoke, actually only 36% of the visits, the smokers are counseled to, to, to go to a program to uh, try to stop uh, smoking. But what is really, uh, I think, uh, uh, worrisome somehow is to see that when we look at this data on a time frame period, we see there has been no change. So in time, although we have more and more evidence, the strategies and the management of the patients has not changed. So again, uh, some room for improvement. If we look at smoking, for example, big study, 13,000 participants, 26 years uh, follow-up. Uh, what we understood is that uh, people that smoke are at higher risk of lead, which is higher than the risk of heavy coronary heart disease or stroke. What we also know that when they smoke, uh, they stop smoking these patients, the greatest benefit is really on the development of lead. But then when they stop smoking, it takes time before uh, this lead risk comes back to an acceptable um, time frame. So, in fact, what we also know that smoking, it's not only important to reduce the cardiovascular risk, this has been well demonstrated, but what is the impact of smoking also on the walking behavior of these patients? Uh, the studies have shown us that the patient that is able to stop smoking is also a patient who will be more inclined to change uh, some lifestyle uh, behavior and to go more towards a, a, hel a healthier uh, behavior, and it will be a patient who be also more inclined and more willing to enroll in an exercise uh, program and therefore have an impact also on the functional status and their uh, walking impairment. Lucia, about yes. smoking, um, do you mean that for every stage of uh, lower extremity artery disease uh, we can have a benefit if you stop smoking or maybe sometimes it is too late? Can you? 
So it, it's never too late because at whatever stage you start, you're going to have a benefit. And since the residual risk is longer, the earlier you stop, the better it is, of course. But even if you are at late stage, it's very important to stop to increase uh, functionals, but also to have a more positive results on, on the, the treatment that you start uh, your patients on. And apparently also women are, are maybe more sensitive to smoking, even passive smoking. There are some. Yeah, there has been some data on passive smoking mm -hmm. is also a risk factor and therefore it's very important. In fact, when we do education to these patients, we counsel them about smoking. It's also very important to include in the consultation not only the patients, but also the family. So that in fact it has to be a common behavior and everybody is more aware and results would be more positive at the end. Mm -hmm. What about diet? But diet, so there has been a lot of investigations on, on diet and coronary heart disease or stroke, but actually little investigation, little data on the dietary composition and, and lead, what type of diet and what, it, what are really uh, the results on, on elite patients. Uh, what we know in a big population study of 26,000 participants, 20 years of follow-up, that those patients that had a high fiber intake or high fruits and vegetable intake were also the patients that would develop lower, uh, um, less lead. So it, this type of diet and this type of diet with these components significantly lowers the risk of lead. So it's also an important therapeutic tools that we have and we need to address with our uh, patients. So do you have a kind of um, recipe that you propose uh, to your patients uh, who are Claudicon and come to you? I would love to have a very precise uh, recipe, but uh, what, what we know is that the diet type, the Mediterranean diet, that, that, that switch in fruits, vegetables, uh, olive oil, it's also a diet that, that, that is good to, to, for our patients. Uh, what we try to do is to try to see decline the Mediterranean diet for each country because you cannot find the same products everywhere, but in each country, each habit, there are some elements that are important and mimic the Mediterranean diet, and that is important to discuss with the patients, try to change behavior. What about hydration? I mean, water Hyd drinking? I mean, Alors, hydration is also very important. Some studies suggest that if you drink, the people that drink more, more than two liters a day, are also the ones that get more benefit also in terms of vascular diseases. So this is also something that we encourage our patients uh, to do, certainly. So what about exercise? Exercise, what we know, it does modify risk factors, so it has a general impact on a, on a global cardiovascular risk. Because in fact, exercise, especially the supervised exercise therapy in lead patients, has been shown to decrease blood pressure and cholesterol levels already three months after the exercise program, which been, these effects were still evident at six months and 12 months after the end of, of the program. Uh, no evidence that this exercise program has uh, an effect on, on body mass index, for example, and body weight or, or, or glucose, but already some effect uh, which is measurable on some of the cardiovascular risk factors. Another effect of exercise, and that's what really we're interested in for our patients, it's the effect of exercise on walking performances. Because at the end, what we want to do with our patients is that they're able to walk farther than what they are doing when they come to visit us. I mean, this has a high impact on their quality of life. The guidelines tell us that when you have a patient with lead that it's symptomatic with intermittent cloud medication, uh, a supervised exercise program is recommended. This is a class one level A uh, recommendation. In fact, the studies have shown us that when you patients that are randomized to supervised exercise training, uh, they do increase significantly their walking performances. They increase maximal walking distance, they increase pain-free walking distance. And most of the studies, they showed uh, increase above 50%, and a significant number above 100% as compared to uh, the baseline uh, uh, parameters. So very efficacious uh, a program, very efficacious tool, uh, therapeutic tool for our uh, patients. Uh, 
supervised versus non-supervised has also been shown to be uh, better uh, compared to walking advice or home-based exercise. And interesting thing that these positive results are there not only at the end of the program, which usually is three months, three times a week, but they persist at six months. So it means that the patients change their habit, they learn how to work, and this beneficial effect persists in time. And this is something extremely uh, important. The other element that it's nice to see is that we know that in, in lead, uh, two-thirds of the patients do not have typical claudication. They have atypical symptoms. And indeed, also when in some studies included patients with atypical lower extremity symptoms, these supervised programs were equally uh, beneficial. So they need to be uh, proposed to all of our symptomatic uh, patients, regardless of the type of symptoms. Lucia, just to clarify, what is typical claudication, what is atypical claudication, what do you mean by that? Uh, a typical claudication would be cramps that you have in the lower extremity, usually the calf or, or, or the thigh, after a fixed uh, distance or, or effort, a pain that uh, disappears uh, within the first couple uh, of minutes. And a typical uh, pain, it's a patient that is unable to tell you exactly where it's localized, it doesn't define it as a cramp, it's a able to, to tell you exactly when it, uh, it arrives and it has some kind of a more uh, uh, non-precise definition and uh, some burning. So you have to be able to catch also all these um, elements. Now to exercise, easy to say, but there are some barriers because uh, no matter what, it's complicated for patients to come three times a week in a center for three months. Uh, and in fact, a systematic review showed us that uh, about 50% of the patients eligible for such a program, when you propose it, they either refuse or they're not interested. And about 20% of the patients say that attending these sessions, it's really inconvenient for them. So therefore, there are other uh, uh, types of exercise uh, programs that you can propose to the patients, such as, for example, the home-based exercise. So the home-based exercise, the patients, uh, they are trained, they are educated by professionals to have a program of exercise that they can do by themselves at home. And what they're asked for, for these patients to come once a week or every two weeks to the, to the training center to show what they have been able to do and to set up the stage for the next uh, uh, weeks uh, and so on. And with this type of follow-up, with this type of program, the patients are able to increase significantly their walking distance, although less than with a supervised, but still very uh, efficient. So it's a way to propose exercise also to those patients that will be uh, uh, not willing to go to a training center and for those where exercise programs are actually not uh, um, available. Now, with this type of programs, uh, still the patients need to go back to the training center once a week or every two weeks. So it might be still a conversion for some of them. So a very recent study looked at whether you can coach the patients by telephone, uh, whether you can just monitor their activity via a wearable uh, uh, activity monitor. And this study showed us that the results are not as good as when you have some kind of face-to-face -face coaching. So in fact, what it means is that the patients need to be constantly motivated to do this program and face-to-face -face interactions at present still, uh, still seem to be very uh, important for the, for the benefit of such uh, programs. Can I ask a question yes. back to the supervised exercise therapy? Because maybe in the audience we have plenty of cardiologists who uh, think about rehabilitation, cardiac rehabilitation. Is it the same way? Is it different? What do you do with your patients in the supervised exercise training program? Okay, so the programs are, are different uh, in the sense that the, for lead patients, you need to have at least two thirds of the sessions that are dedicated to walking. Uh, it's either Nordic walking or it can be walking on a treadmill. And the, the, the third of the sessions are dedicated to muscular strengthening and equilibrium exercises. These are patients that are old, often. So they have a lot of other comorbidities and so you need to take care of also all the other aspects in order for them to learn how to work and to be able to work. So in this regard, the programs are, are different. What are the mechanisms 
that underlie the benefit of exercise. Several hypotheses, several things have been uh, demonstrated, and what really comes out is there is exercise induces an increase of oxygen delivery at the muscle level, and that muscles are able to, to use their oxygen in a more performant uh, way, and there is a reduction of inflammation, the local, like at the systemic uh, uh, level. So a lot of mechanism, many of the things still need to be studied. We do not know exactly what are the molecular mechanism by which exercise is beneficial, but several uh, pathways that are under investigation. In my student years, uh, it was said that when you walk and your cloudy content, you walk, you're improving your microcirculation uh, or, or uh, developing collaterals. Is it still a something which is evidenced or? So there is not real clear evidence about the, we think that, yeah, the microcirculation does play a role. Uh, it's difficult to study microcirculation. Uh, so the proof of it, it's also not, not really there, but probably there is an effect. Uh, what we know is that the, after the programs, you don't have major uh, increase of flow in the lower extremity. You have no change on vascular major parameters. Probably you have a bit more collaterals, uh, but really a lot is the muscle, the, 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 the metabolism of the muscles that becomes more performant and is able to, to, to sustain more effort with the same amount of oxygen that arrives. So we arrive to our second MCQ. Which of the following is not correct? For patients undergoing endovascular revascularization, combination of supervised exercise training with PTA is the best option. Supervised exercise training programs are available throughout Europe. In absence of supervised exercise training, home-based programs may be proposed. Healthy diet and fiber intake are associated with decreased risk of symptomatic lead. So we have here to spot the incorrect response. Okay, so meanwhile, uh, there was a question about the audience about uh, whether a muscle atrophy, atrophy could be a sign of lower extremity artery disease? Uh, it's associated. It's associated because this is also patients that walk less, that move less, uh, and, and therefore uh, it might be associated. And one of the ideas of doing some exercise of strengthening and reconditioning in the programs are also very important. Okay, so if you look at the responses for this question, two-thirds actually spotted the answer number two. Supervised exercise training programs are available throughout Europe, so for most of them, this is not the correct answer. And this is correct, and we will see that afterwards. So if we take the first uh, um, uh, uh, statement that we put there, it's a question that comes, what about patients that undergo revascularization? Is it true you revascularize, you're happy, you're satisfied, you increase walking performance and everything else becomes uh, uh, less important? In fact, I just show you one slide with its meta-analysis, uh, uh, about 3,000 patients with intermittent claudication, uh, and this meta-analysis actually compared groups of patients where they had only best medical therapy, where they had only uh, angioplasty, where they had only supervised exercise therapy, or where they had the combination of angioplasty and supervised exercise therapy. And actually what the data show us that those patients that were uh, treated by endovascular treatment and supervised exercise training program, those are the ones that benefited the most. They were ones that were able to increase uh, at most their walking distances and their quality of life. And this is really not too much a surprise because these two interventions actually uh, target different mechanisms, pathways. With revascularization, you do improve blood flow, which you don't really do with the exercise, but with exercise, you, you ameliorate the muscular uh, performances. So therefore, these two mechanisms are actually synergistic, and probably one of the best strategies in the management of our patients is not either to try to choose between one or the other, but when the moment comes that you need the revascularization, it would be a good idea probably to combine revascularization with exercise to get the most out of your uh, uh, treatment for your uh, uh, patient.
So you addressed exercise therapy, discussed a bit about revascularization. One question is about drugs and specifically cyclostazole. <coughs> Where is the place of this uh, such a treatment in the management of claudicans? Okay, there are a few studies on psilostazole and walking uh, uh, performances. The drug does increase walking performance, but in a moderate way. It's not as good uh, as exercise. And the amount of, of amelioration actually sometimes is similar to what you get in the placebo. So it's not something you propose at first uh, uh, choice to your patient. But there are patients that cannot walk, you cannot do anything else. So on a case-by-case -case base, you can discuss about psilostazole. But you have to be also bear in mind that there are side effects, so you have to put everything in the balance. And probably when we speak about drugs, uh, the, 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 the way psilostazole ameliorates the walking uh, performances is similar to what you see with statins. So in the balance, uh, since you give to all these patients statins, we don't know what is the additional benefit of adding a psilostazole. So what you're saying is that statins improve the walking distance? So statins have been shown in some studies, still remains controversial, it's not clear cut, but to have some kind of trend towards amelioration of walking performances. So this is the answer to our uh, questions before. Despite all the evidence, despite the recommendations, uh, despite really all the awareness that uh, it starts to, to, to be heard more and more, uh, the supervised exercise training is underused in Europe and probably not just uh, in Europe. And where it's used, there is a lot of variability in terms of organization, the structuring, the reimbursement among countries, but it's also a wide variability within the same country. So, so this is really a field where we still uh, have to work and there's really room for improvements. So you have uh, a, a um, supervised exercise training uh, program in your, in your centre. Yes. So if in one country one centre wants to start uh, such a program, what would be your short advice how to start, how to do? Uh, my advice would be to start in a center. You need to have uh, uh, the, the, the patients, you need to have a trained physiotherapy or sport uh, uh, person that really uh, knows what the disease is, motivates the people and uh, sets up the, the program in a controlled, structured way. And then very important is to integrate in the program also some hours of educational uh, for the patients because it's not just walking, but there you can introduce the counseling for stop smoking, the diet and everything, everything else. So it's really a global approach, a global program that would encourage encourage the patient to a lifestyle uh, modification. So we come to the conclusion. Uh, lifestyle modification exercises are beneficial. They do reduce cardiovascular risk, but they also improve a patient function. They improve the quality of life. They improve walking performances. Supervised exercise programs significantly improve walking performance, and whenever possible, those should be uh, uh, set up and should be more and more available uh, to patients. Therefore, there is really a need to increase awareness on lifestyle modification, implement exercise programs widely on the territory, uh, as close as possible to where the patients live. Uh, and the other aspect is really need to find strategies to motivate patients. It has to be a team effort. It's not only the physicians, not only the professional that implement things and tell the patients what to do, but they have to be aware and only if we work together will be a win-win situation. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Just the last question about your case. Um, uh, the patient had a, a low ABI on the left side and the duplex result didn't confirm a significant stenosis. So, uh, one question was about the use of CT scan in that situation. Would it change the management of the patient, actually? I, it would not change. Well, the ultrasound, what you showed that you have a serial, uh, non-hemodynamically uh, non significant, but serial uh, uh, stenosis. So that also does, has an impact and it can explain many things. But uh, if you do not, uh, have not foreseen revascularization, a CT scan at this stage, it's, it's not useful.
Thank you very much. So all about exercise, diet, and now let's turn to the second uh, presentation by uh, Professor Espinola Klein on the pharmacology and lower extremity artery disease. Christina. Thank you, Victor. It's a pleasure for me to join and to be part of this uh, webinar. The topic of my talk is the evidence-based pharmac pharmacologic treatment of LEAD. And in fact, they're good news at last. These are my disclosures. So I also uh, have a patient. I have a 67 years a year old male patient with a multi-site atherosclerosis. The patient uh, ha underwent a carotid surgery of both internal carotid arteries and at the moment he has no restenosis by duplex scan. In addition, he suffers from coronary artery disease. But in the moment, we have a stable situation. The stress echo has showed normal response. He suffered now from his lower extremity arterial disease. He has a history of an angioplasty of the left common iliac artery. And now he's limited by intermittent claudication, Rutherford 3, because of a high degree restenosis in this former treated artery. The patient also has multiple risk factors. He's a smoker, he has high lipid levels, he has arterial hypertension, and he also has, uh, is, uh, has diabetes. When we look to his current medication, he has aspirin as an antiplatelet therapy, he uses ramipril for his hypertension, he takes simvastatin and metformin. What we did first in this patient, we treated the restenosis successfully by drug coated balloon. Now we have a multi site atherosclerotic patient after angioplasty of a restenosis in the iliac artery. What about antithrombotic treatment? And I directly come to my first question Which antithrombotic treatment would you use in this patient at this moment? Would you stay on aspirin? Would you change to clopidogrel? Or would you use aspirin and clopidogrel in a combination? Would we, you switch to rivaroxaban twice daily, 5 mg? Or would you use rivaroxaban low dose two times a day, 2.5 and aspirin? What is your um, answer to this question? <coughs> okay, so waiting for the responses. So in the end, your patient had a long history. He was quite young. He was even younger than 50 when he started to have carotid disease. So this is um, mostly smokers or yeah. is there any is family history or family uh, hypercholesterolemia or whatever? Well, one of the problems of this patient was in fact that he starts smoking in very young years at the age of 15. So uh, the patient had a long history of smoking and uh, the other risk factors were also not under control for a very long time. And then he starts to be diagnosed and treated and then um, he didn't stop smoking anymore. So it's a problem. Okay, so uh, when you look at the answers, there is more than 50%, 52% who would propose rivaroxaban low dose plus aspirin, so the item E, followed by 28% who propose DAPT, as, uh, aspirin plus clopidogrel, and the other responses were quite low, Riva alone 6%, clopidogrel 75 and aspirin alone 3%. So what do you think about this? Uh, uh, Combination. Well, I think the answer is triggered by the, by the results from the COMPASS trial showing that uh, rivaroxaban low dose and aspirin, I show the data uh, very soon, um, have uh, in fact uh, really impact on prognosis of these patients. Some of the uh, uh, use the dual antiplatelet therapy after intervention such as we do in cardiology. So we have only low evidence in peripheral arteries. Nevertheless, many of us use for a while 
about one month, for example, a dual antiplatelet therapy after an intervention. So you were mentioning COMPASS. So in COMPASS, we, do mm -hmm. we have patients who already have uh, just a, a stenting, uh, a recent stenting on peripheral, or they were excluded? Of the, of the trial? It was, uh, in the COMPASS trial, it was allowed to do uh, a stenting, but uh, there is another trial, the Voyager trial, exactly dealing with these patients in this situation. We will have the results, we all yeah. hope soon, but uh, its Voyager results are not published, are not uh, available so far. I will show you the study design later. So when we look to the guidelines, um, the guidelines have been published 2017. In this guide, in the guidelines to this time, the COMPASS trial was not available so far. So in symptomatic patients, a single antiplatelet therapy is recommended. After percutaneous revascularization, dual antiplatelet therapy can be done for about a month. And after bypass surgery, usually single antiplatelet therapy should be recommended. In some cases, also vitamin K antagonist can be used. Christine, I see uh, management of patients who are not requiring anticoagulation. Yes. So just for one moment, if, for example, your patient had an AFib, what would you do then? We know that usually it is enough if the patient has an indication for an oral anticoagulation to give or to take this medication. So if the patient has a FIP, it is not necessary to add an antiplatelet. It is enough if the patient takes um, rivaroxaban, apixaban, or vitamin K antagonist, or edoxaban, anyway, dabigatran. So it's enough to take the anticoagulant medication. It is not necessary to add the antiplatelet in addition, usually. Because you, you're referring about the bleeding risk when you have yes. full dose OAX and, and, and aspirin. And the benefit is minimal. So you should use the anticoagulant in full dosage without um, adding an antiplatelet. The guidelines are based on the CAPRI trial. In the CAPRI trial, aspirin was compared to clopidogrel. It's a quite old study, but the study nevertheless showed that the number of cardiac events, such as myocardial infarct, stroke, or uh, cardiovascular death, was in particular reduced in patients with lower extremity artery disease um, when they took clopidogrel in comparison to aspirin single uh, antiplatelet therapy. Now I come to the COMPASS trial already mentioned. In the COMPASS trial, uh, more than 27,000 patients have been included, most of them with stable coronary artery disease, but we have also a group of uh, 7,450 patients with peripheral atherosclerosis. The COMPASS quite compared rivaroxaban low dose and aspirin in, combina in uh, comparison to rivaroxaban 5 mg twice daily to aspirin single antiplatelet therapy. When we look to the group of patients with peripheral artery sclerosis, most of them had symptomatic lead, some have carotid artery stenosis, and the minority have an asymptomatic lower extremity artery disease and coronary artery disease. Here you see the results for the combi combined endpoint major adver adverse cardiac event and major adverse limb events, including major amputation. As you can see here, this is the aspirin single arm, and this is the arm of the combination of low dose aspirin and uh, a lot of rivaroxaban and aspirin. And there was a risk reduction of 31% hazard ratio with a hazard ratio of 0.69 and this was a significant relevant reduction in cardiovascular risk in these patients. If we can just stay one day, moment on these uh, curves. Um, were these patients well treated regarding risk fa other risk factors or? Yes, they were on best medical treatment, on statin and uh, blood pressure control and all other facts were similar in both groups. So you mean that in a very recent uh, contemporary trial where patients with uh, lead are well treated and are on their aspirin alone, after three years you have up to 15% of events? Yes. 
We know. Is, is, is it, um, is it um, what you see also in your clinical practice? Yes, we see this because we have here we have patients with intermittent claudication, stable patients, but still in these patients the risk of cardiovascular event of cardiovascular mortality is quite high. It's as high as in cancer patients. So we have high risk patients with multi-site atherosclerosis. Some of them have, no, have coronary artery disease and have no, uh, they don't know that they have coronary artery disease because they are limited by claudication. So we have a high risk population. So this, this is exactly that what we see in clinical practice. Now, last year we have new guidelines and these guidelines already include the COMPASS results. So the guidelines from the European Society of Vascular Medicine um, recommend the use of aspirin and uh, rivaroxaban low dose in patients with peripheral artery disease with, uh, with, without a high bleeding risk. And a similar recommendation was done uh, by the EC guidelines on diabetes and, and stable coronary artery, uh, coronary artery disease. In both guidelines, um, the low-dose rivaroxaban and aspirin combination is recommended in patients with high risk of, with lead patients with high risk for cardiovascular events and low bleeding risk. I mentioned already the Voyager trial. This is the trial um, including patients after revascularization. On the one hand, patients after percutaneous interventions, but also after bypass surgery. Again, a randomization for rivaroxaban low dose and aspirin in a comparison to aspirin alone. And we hope that we will have in, in a few months or a few weeks the results from this trial. What we, did, what we did with our patient, we did the same as recommended by the auditorium. We uh, st first uh, gave the patient one month dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and clopidogrel, and then we switched to the low-dose rivaroxaban and aspirin uh, compass trial uh, regimen. But what about the risk factors? Of course, we advise the patient of stop smoking. We nicely uh, saw the results by Lucia. The patient has still other risk factors. What about these risk factors? I want to start with high lipid levels. We nicely know that uh, LDL reduction is close uh, associated with a reduce in cardiovascular risk. And we also know that uh, there is an association um, with regard to patients with LEAD. In this large um, analysis of 90,000 patients, patients took high intensive statin therapy that was atorvastatin or rosuvastatin or moderate statin therapy such as simvastatin in comparison to those who took no statin. And as you can see here, the mortality was significantly reduced when the patient took a statin and in addition when the patient took high intensive statins. And you see similar results with regard to the endpoint, endpoint amputation. Again, there was a relevant reduction of lower limb amputation in lead patient when they took a high intensive statin. And the results go in line with the results from uh, recent results from PCSK9 inhibitor studies. These are results from the Fourier tri with evolucumab. As you can see, again, a combined endpoint of maze of cardiac event and limb event in patients with and without lower limb extremity disease, and the number needed to treat to uh, prevent one event was only 25 in patients with lead in comparison to 67 in patients with no lead. So the patients, again, as we discussed previously, have a much higher risk compared to those without lower extremity arterial disease. And these were all patients with coronary artery disease, but in comparison, they, um, they have a larger risk reduction when we treat the risk factors. I figure out that even in your curve, you have yeah. exactly the same rate after three years that we yeah. had in Compass. Yes. So this is also 
confirming that the residual risk of this patient is very high. It's very high, right. So I come to the second question. Do we have target LDL cholesterol for these patients with polyvascular atherosclerosis? And which value, when yes, should we reach? Less than 116 milligram to deciliter or less than 100, less than 70, less than 55, or we don't need target values, just fire and forget. I think it's a very uh, current question. Absolutely. And your question is about the target, whatever would be the treatment, or do you have a, a first-line treatment, whatever? What I, your... I think first-line should be statin, mm -hmm. and I usually use the high-intensive statins, so uh, you reach more with mm -hmm. them. In many cases, we need acetamib in addition, and in some cases, we then need PCSK9 inhibitors to reach the, when we need targets. Yes, we need targets. <laughs> So we need uh, to reach the targets. Okay, so let's see what are the responses. Here we are. So it seems that uh, many of uh, uh, people in the audience have uh, read the uh, recent guidelines on this epidemia because two out of three responders ch have chosen the 55 milligram threshold. 23% have chosen 70 milligrams and very lower um, rates for other thresholds. So mostly have picked the 55. So they are totally right. This is what the new guidelines recommend. Here you see the change in the guideline. Now we have uh, the lower 55 milligram per deciliter in the guidelines. And again, smoking cessation is highly recommended and statins are of course recommended. This slide is from the new uh, guidelines on lipid lowering therapy. Patients first have to be classified in risk groups and then we can decide what is my target LDL cholesterol and all patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease such as lead patients of course are, are in this very high risk group and should be treated until the LDL cholesterol is lower than 55. And I figure out that even in these guidelines, they not only say 55, but also a reduction of more yep. than 50%. Yes. That is the end, not the all yes. that we had be before. So Yes, and there is also an addition. If the patient had recurrent events, we should reach even lower than 40. So. Um, it is really hard in, in clinical practice to reach these targets. Next uh, risk factor of our patient is hypertension. And the guidelines recommend that the blood pressure in patients with peripheral artery disease and hypertension should be lower than 140 to 90. And in these patients, in particular in lead patients, um, inhibitors of the renin angiotensin system such as ACE inhibitors or ARBs should be considered as first-line therapy. And the last risk factor of our patient is diabetes. For diabetes, we also have new guidelines since last year. The European Society Diabetes Guidelines first address the patient whether he is naive, he has no treatment so far for the diabetes, or if the patient has already a treatment. If the patient has no previous treatment for diabetes and he has atherosclerotic uh, disease such as coronary artery disease, peripheral artery disease or carotid artery stenosis, these patients should first be treated by an SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor antagonist. This is because these uh, drugs showed a risk reduction in patients at increased risk of atherosclerosis. The other patient with no atherosclerotic disease should start with metformin monotherapy. And then we have to look whether the patient reaches the targets and then maybe add an additional treatment. But it should be mentioned that SGLT2 inhibitors um, are off-label if you use them without a metformin medication, because on-label you need metformin on board, so we have 
to say the patient, to tell the patient that this uh, is uh, so far an uh, off-label use. If the patient has already metformin on board, we also talk about atherosclerosis, yes or no. And if the patient has atherosclerosis, again, you should first treat with an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor antagonist. If the patient has no atherosclerotic disease, you can choose one of the other anti-diabetic treatment tools. I will show you the results from the ENGPAREC outcome study. It's one, uh, it's the, what was the first study from uh, one SGLT2 receptor antagonists. Here you see the result from the two point MACE endpoint, death from cardiovascular causes, non fatal myocardial infarction, or no fatal stroke. And as you can see, empagliflozine um, reduced this primary endpoint by a hazard ratio of 0.86. And in the next slide, you can see the results for patients with lead in this study and patients without lead at baseline, baseline. And as you can see, similar to the previous trials I showed you, the risk reduction is some larger in these high-risk patients because they are already at high risk compared to the other ones. What about our patient? Well, we advised him to stop smoking, of course. The LDL cholesterol under simvastatin 40 mg was 101, too high. We have to reach less than 55. Blood pressure was quite okay. The blood pressure was 130 to 80, and diabetes was also elevated although the patient has, has already metformin on board. Christine, you, you mentioned blood pressure was okay. One of the questions of the audience yeah. was about the level of blood pressure to, in, in, in patients with lower mm -hmm. extremities. Do we have any concern about uh, decreasing the blood pressure in these patients? Or, and, and what would be your target, actually? Um, the target uh, would, in fact, be the target of the, of the current guidelines, less than 140 in systolic blood pressure. But there are studies, in fact, if you lower the blood pressure of less than 120, you can have more adverse events in patients, in patients with lead, in patients with vascular disease. So you should keep the blood pressure in this target values. It should not be too low, of course not be too high. So I usually do um, a 24 hour blood pressure measurement to exactly know what are the times the patient needs more medication, for example. But it's a good, very good question. We should be careful not to, to, low, to lower the blood pressure in the two, uh, uh, too, too low, yes. What would we did in our patient? We add rivaroxaban at, at uh, addressed before. We changed the statin from simvastatin to rosuvastatin. We um, think uh, ramipril was okay for him as treatment, and we added empagliflozin to treat his diabetes. So I want to conclude. Antipatal therapy is recommended in all patients with symptomatic lead. And clopidogrel should be preferred over aspirin if we choose for single antiplatelet therapy. Dual pathway anticoagulation, including rivaroxaban plus aspirin, should be considered in lead patients at high risk for ischemic events and without a high bleeding risk. Statin therapy is indicated in all patients with lead. And the target LDL cholesterol should be lower than 55 mg per deciliter. ACE inhibitors or ARBs should be considered as first-line therapy in patients with lead and hypertension. And finally, in patients with cardiovascular disease and diabetes, SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 inhibitors are first-line medications. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. So we have uh, still a couple of minutes to answer to a couple of questions coming from the audience. One is uh, interesting to address, I think, to remove any uh, confusion. The question is there, asymptomatic patients with lead don't need antithrombotic treatments. So once a symptomatic patient becomes asymptomatic, should I stop antithrombotics? No. 
when the patient had, has had once symptoms and now he improved, he still have to keep on an antiplatelet therapy. This recommendation is only for patients who have never been symptomatic, who have all, only a low ABI and no symptoms, never had any symptoms of LEAD. So we have addressed um, uh, earlier this uh, uh, treat vasodilator treatment as silestazole. There are also, again, questions about uh, the silestazole or pentoxifilin regarding the use of now uh, the um, dual pathway inhibition. Should, can we add silestazole or not? Apparently, we don't have any evidence on benefit on that. We have no data, but silestazole is all, also a, a kind of antiplatelet. Uh, he also makes some kind of antiplatelet, not so much as the usual antiplatelets, but um, the bleeding risk is slightly increased. So but if we have already a patient on their low dose rivaroxaban and aspirin? I would not uh, add mm. this medication. Okay, and the, the, about the lipids also, what about the triglycerides? Uh, do we have any threshold about the use of to, 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 to treat the triglycerides in these patients? Um, we have little evidence in lead patients, but we have also a new discussion about triglycerides are important, of course, with regard to the total lipid risk of the patients. So I think we have to look for, uh, for this, for the total lipid profile of the patient, and we can lower this nicely by healthy diet and exercise. So I think this is a very good tool to can be improved also by lifestyle recommendations. I think we have to keep in mind that, that the patient is as a whole. We have a different uh, therapeutic strategies and we have to combine them and use them because the effects are really additive and synergistic and we should not forget. One last question. This is rather more about diagnosis than treatment, but uh, let's go for it. Is ABI measurement with Figma manometer reliable in clinical practice? So do you use those automated machines for the arms to measure ABI? What do you do? What do you think? We don't use it. We don't use it uh, and uh, there we need to have some really clear studies to show and to compare the validity of this system, which we do not have at present. And since the diagnosis of disease is based on these measurements, I think we have to be really clear cut sure of what we're doing, because it's easy to, to switch from disease and a healthy status. Thank you very much. So we are approaching now the end of this webinar and I would like to close this uh, session by summarizing the key messages for your daily practice. Patients with lower extremity artery disease are not only at high risk of cardiovascular mortality and events, but they are significantly impaired in their daily life activity. We must systematically include exercise therapy as a pillar of their management along with other lifestyle modifications. Optimal medical therapy includes also pharmacology, including statins, with more stringent criteria nowadays, and antithrombotic therapy, up to dual pathway inhibition with low-dose rivaroxaban and aspirin in those at highest risk. Thank you to Professor Espinola Klein and Professor Mazolai. And I invite all those more interested by this disease and other vascular conditions to join our working group of aorta and PVD through the ESC website. The program is supported by Bayer Healthcare in the form of an educational grant. You will be able to watch this webinar on demand on the ESC website. Thank you.